Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are going to get kicked off here today again. As I mentioned, this is the fourth in our wisdom series. Today, we are talking about leveling up our negotiation skills. And as, as you've heard us say this before, we all know we need to negotiate on a daily basis. It's negotiating for our clients, negotiating for ourselves, whether it's a promotion or our commissions or in our personal lives. I, I know that I have Miss Lizzie sitting here behind me and this dog is a, a, an expert at negotiating what she wants. So we are negotiating with all levels and all, all people and souls in our lives on a daily basis. Uh, today we have Dottie Herman and Alex too joining us for a conversation. And Alex is really gonna lead this conversation for us today and highlight some of the amazing wisdom and experience that Dottie brings into our industry. I'm going to have her introduce her as well. Before I do that, though, uh, I want to set the stage for who Alex is in this conversation because we have had her lead so many amazing conversations over the years inside the Woman Up community. But this one in particular, when Sarah and I were talking about who would make sense to lead this conversation, who can really help us shine a light on the right person. Alex was the first one to came to mind because of her experience with the Movoto acquisition. So Alex, um, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to share that story, share about Movoto, and then let's roll right into getting Dottie highlighted and kick the show off. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Awesome. All right. All right, ladies, I will be back at the end. Everyone, as usual, chat your questions. We will do a Q&A with these two powerhouses at the end. See you. Right. So, you know, thank you so much, Deborah. Um, you know, what are the, thank you for asking me to lead this session. So one of the reasons um, we, Deborah, Sarah, and I, we started talking about, you know, what it is to negotiate. And about three or four months ago, I just uh, finished putting together an acquisition. Um, it was a $60 million acquisition of Movoto uh, and it got bought out by Ojo. And a lot of people have asked me like, how did that happen? And one of the things that happened is that it was actually a relationship that I've had for 20 years um, with a fellow by the name of Chris Heller, who was the former CEO of Keller Williams. Um, he was actually my real estate mentor when back in the days when we were calling FISBOs and expire listings. And so when we were talking about relationships and where that would lead to, who knew that 20 years later that we would be putting together this huge acquisition of two of the top leading real estate lead gen companies in the country. Um, and so I am so fortunate that when um, Sarah and Deborah asked me to lead this discussion about negotiations and leadership, there is seriously no one better when I think of a trailblazer and, you know, and this is uh, Dottie's first appearance at a uh, woman up. It's I feel very fortunate <laughs> that I'm going to get the first interview to our woman up community with Dottie. And for those of you who don't know Dottie um, in, let me just put it to you this way. She started her career in 1978. That's 42 years ago. But then in 1989, she bought Prudential and in two, 2003 CEO of Douglas Elliman. Um, and when I think about um, Trailblazer, I mean, Dottie, you've been, you know, opening up offices, buying companies in the millions of dollars. And in 2016, you were recognized by Forbes as America's richest self-made woman in real estate. So can I please? Well, <laughs> I the, kept on acquiring, so I don't know about the riches. But I had probably the most debt. But I, but I, <laughs> but it was a, uh, it was a big honor, and I just want everyone to know I'm honored to be here. And thank you, Alex, and thank you all of um, the board. And I love this organization. I met I met them last year at something in New York, and I was totally impressed. And so um, it, is, it is my pleasure to be here. And hopefully the next time you get together, we'll be past this COVID thing and we can all see each other in person. Oh. So I look forward to that. Well, thank you, Dottie. So since this is our first, our first discussion with the Woman Up community, why don't we start with just um, 
you know, why don't you tell me if you can, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey. Um, and, and because this is a discussion about, your, you know, and Women Up is really about making sure that more women get into leadership positions within our industry. And so tell me a little bit about your journey so that the folks that are listening in can understand um, everything from, you know, what made you make that decision to buy Prudential um, at that time? And if you can tell that Prudential story that, you know, start off with there and then how it led you. Sure. To I, um, when I got out of school, um, I worked for Merrill Lynch and Merrill Lynch in the eighties was it. And they sold stocks and I had a series seven and then Merrill Lynch decided to open a national real estate company and figured, well, we'll sell a client a stock. We'll, we have a bank, we'll give them a mortgage and then we'll sell them a house and we'll make multiple profit centers from the same person. So nobody wanted to go to the real estate part. I mean, they were like, we want to stay with Merrill stock work, which we don't want to be in real estate. But so they took anybody new that had no <laughs> choice. So they stuck me in the real estate part. And I have to tell you, it was probably one of the big, best experiences and probably changed my life, life significantly because they were a company that believed in the people that worked for them, that believed that the people were their assets. And mm -hmm. I was able to see real estate, you know, we see it sometimes very locally from wherever we're from. And with Merrill, since they were a national company, I was able to see real estate from a national view, not just, you know, um, New York view or California view nationally. So to make a long story short, I was like a sponge. I went to everything. Uh, they were great with training and people would say to me, oh, why would you do that? They're not paying. And I'd say, I just want to learn. And I learned so much with them. And then all of a sudden came over an announcement that Merrill was selling their real estate company and they no longer wanted to keep it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to invest their money in the global markets. And I was devastated. Now that I was devastated, I was now probably in my 20s, like 24, 25. I had just gotten divorced. I had a daughter. I said, here I am, divorced. I won't be having a job. <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and I love this company. So for one year... It was all on the papers, you know, that they were selling the company and we were getting raided by every real estate company there was. And they said, we, Prudential came and then Prudential bought. And we went to a meeting and I'm sorry if there's anyone from Prudential, but in those days, Prudential, you know, they dressed kind of ugly and, you know, Merrill were all sharp and they were kind of like, and they're like, we don't want to own a real estate company. We don't think real estate is national. We think that it's individual. We're going to franchise. So, Dottie, you'll be out of a job. And I was running the Northeast region at that point. But I was in California a lot because one of my big, good friends, Steve Gaines, worked for Merrill. And he had like 130 offices in California. So my job basically was to keep my part of the company together until they found the buyer. Mm -hmm. So and I think I was probably about 26 or 27 and I was so sad. And somebody said to me, well, Donnie, why don't you buy it? And I said, well, I have no money. That's why. <laughs> he said, so what? Just say that you do. And, you know, there's something really great about being young. Because <laughs> I said, oh, well, that's a good idea. I'll do it. And. I proceeded to, with a little help from my friends to write a business plan. And by the way, I'd already tried banks. They hung up in my face. They said, we wouldn't even lend you the money for one office, let alone a company. We had like 37 offices then. And to make a long story short, I wrote them a letter and said that I had venture capital money, which I didn't have a dollar, and that I wanted to arrange a meeting because I would like to take over. I'm the best person to take over this company and to own it. And by the way, I was the youngest person in the company also. And I stood in front of uh, 1,700 people at the time. And I said, and being the youngest, I said, stick with me. I'm going to buy the company. And somehow I said it with a lot of conviction. And even though they knew I didn't have the money, they believed in me. 
And I said, together we're going to be strong and we're going to buy this company. To make a long story short, I met with Prudential and uh, of course in negotiating, you never say the bad things first, right? You always <laughs> say all the good stuff because you don't want them to force their hands and turn off. So I told them all the wonderful things and how much more money we're going to make and how much money we'd make Prudential as a franchise. And then of course I had to tell them, but there's just one thing. I don't have money, but why don't you lend it to me? And they're wow. like, Prudential, we can't lend it to you. You have to go to a bank. But why can't you? Well, we just can't. And to make a long story short, I would say three or four months later, they lent me, and I was about now 26, 27. They lent me like 19 or 14 million for the company. And then I borrowed three or four million dollars in working capital. And no personal guarantees because I had a thousand dollars, if that, in the bank. So I couldn't personally guarantee it. And um, I became an entrepreneur overnight. Um, and then a year later, we went into a, I think it was 2000, I mean, I think it was 90, in the 90s, we went into a recession. And they based the company, um, they based the prices on the last five years. And so now, of course, as soon as I bought the company, we're in a recession. I can't pay the franchise fees. I'm not paying them. They're coming to wow. take my company. Wow. So I found out where their headquarters were. I, I got a car service. I drove to Newark because that's where they were located. And I really was hysterical. It wasn't an act. And I walked into this bunch of men bankers and I was crying like, you're not taking my company. You can't take it. Okay, the world is going through a recession. It's not something I'm doing. And to make a lot, they forgave half the debt. And, um, and they really did. They forgave it more than half the debt. And they said, and now go find a bank and leave us alone. In which I did. And um, that was um, remarkable. And everyone said, well, you couldn't do that now. So that's, you did it. I said, you couldn't do that then either. Mm -hmm. But I asked. And so if anything that I can teach you or stress to everybody that I learned a long time ago, don't ever be afraid to ask. The worst right. that somebody could say is no. Right. Um, well, I, so if I, right. and, and it was a, a question that really, if you were in your right mind, you wouldn't ask it because you would think, well, they're, they're going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> but I did buy the company. And then I've always had a good relationship. And I think you said it before about relationships. You never know where you're going to meet people in life. I've always tried to maintain a great, good relationship and be a team player. And so when we were hit in New York in 9-11, okay? So now the World Trade Center is down. I mean, it's a mess in New York. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. And um, I used some of my selling skills from sales, from being in sales and cold called. And I cold called a company called Insignia that had the largest real estate company in New York City. And I said, would you ever sell your company? Mm-hmm. And the man, his name was Andrew Farkas, said to me, if you get 72 million, I will. And I said, great. Went back to Prudential. Uh -huh. I said, I can buy the New York company, the number one New York company. All I need is 72 million. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's all. On a cold call, no less. <laughs> yeah. And it really sounds, even when I tell the story, it almost sounds surreal, but the truth is it really is real. And so... And now, don't forget, after 9-11, we were expecting a second terrorist attack in New York. So we were already hit. And so I would say at least twice a month, three times a month, there would be orange alert, red alert. You'd have to vacate. So for a, a banker to lend me money during 9-11, or like right after that, is really risky, even if I had millions, okay? Because what was going to happen to New York. And so the banker who I had a good relationship with, I always helped Prudential out. I always was a team player. He said, Donnie, am I crazy lending you this money? We're on orange alert now. And I said, Andrew, if they blow up New York again, it's over anyway. And by the way, I'll have arrows Hamptons that way. 
And nice. I have to tell you, in 2000, a year after 9-11, in 2002, or the end of 2001, we purchased Douglas Elman, which was the largest residential real estate brokerage in New York City. Right. And um, I remember going there. I, I'm from Long Island, and all the, there was all these brokers, like, what are your credentials? And what do you do? And like, you know, who are you? And I said, you know, I don't want you to respect or like me because of the title. Mm -hmm. I said, but I can tell you I'm a broker and I know what it's like to not know where that next deal is coming from. And I know what it's like to have a bad streak. I don't want anyone. I don't, I want you just to give me a chance and allow me to earn your respect. Right. Right. And, um, I, I would tell you this, I wouldn't be where I was without the help of that company. You know, they all just came together. And of course, then we had to integrate the rest of the other companies we had. Uh, but it was a life-changing moment. And if I, if I can tell you that what happened to me really is not a norm, it's not, it's, it, it's, it doesn't normally happen. But when you have a dream and you want to do something, like, what's the worst that can happen? Somebody says, oh, that girl's a fool to even ask me. I mean, that's really the worst that can happen. Mm -hmm. And you really never know unless you ask and ask and ask. And right. so I, um, and again, as we talk about negotiations, that's so important. Yeah. First of all, have good relationships along the way. Right. Right. And, and when you're negotiating, don't start off with the, always start off with the good stuff first. <laughs> right, right. I always start off with the good stuff. And I didn't, I wanted to, you know, tell your story in your own words about Prudential and buying Douglas Elliman, um, because it truly is an incredible story of, you know, at what, 27, 28 years old, uh, you know, getting an $18 million loan and getting some of that forgiven. Um, but I guess one of the things that I, I'm always curious is that, um, you know, this is big, big money and even bigger back in 1989, 1978 oh. and 89, you know. And so, so my, and you were working with some of the most toughest negotiators and bankers in the industry. Can you let us know and, and let us know what is it? What are some of the lessons that, you know, you can tell us about, you know, what it took to not only walk into those rooms, but actually be able to accomplish some of the deals that you were able to be successful in uh, putting together? I will tell you that I always, I read in the book, probably when I was in my early 20s, that if you want to get ahead in life, you need to know the right, you need to know the people that make the decisions. So... I made sure to, and I was heartbroken over Merrill Lynch being sold, but even at Merrill Lynch, I made sure to know and go to things that I knew some of the big people that made the big decisions, because that's a big company, so mm -hmm. they weren't local. I made sure to go to things and meet those people and make sure they knew who I was. I also, again, they were, um, Merrill wasn't, but Prudential was a franchise. And since Merrill had a much higher end name than Prudential, um, I helped organize for their whole franchise, their, their fine homes division. I was always pretty active and I really wasn't getting paid for that. I did it to be a team player, so they knew me. And when I had an opportunity to buy New York City, they wanted me to win. They wanted me to get it. They wanted to, because they liked me and they, they had, earned, you know, I had earned their respect and they were rooting for me. And um, it was a stretch for them to do that. And then there was a woman in Prudential that ran all of Prudential, not just the real estate. Her name was Jean Hamilton. And she was one of the only women because they didn't have any women then. And she wasn't even in real estate. She just ran the whole thing. And she was nice enough, always find a mentor. She was nice enough to take me to all these, um, you know, Prudential was a public company, so she took me to all these big, big conferences for women of huge companies. Because again, when I was in the business, when I started the business, 
you know, we had 30 something offices, 40, but that was a lot. I mean, you know, yeah. they didn't have them like today. So, um, you know, I learned from her. I wasn't afraid to ask for help. Yeah. And I wasn't afraid to ask someone like, would you help me? Could I, could I learn from you? Uh, and once I decided to do something, I know there's no one in life, I don't care what profession you're in, that doesn't fall, trip, fail a bunch of times. There's no one that goes through life never failing. And what happens is we, we all read about the people when they're successful and how that they achieve their success. And what they never really tell you is, hey, they might have achieved great success, but they also failed plenty. Yes. So it's kind of also how you, how you win and how you, fit, how you lose. And when you, you know, when everything's going wrong and everything that you put your guts into falls apart and you feel like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I, I just, you gotta just wipe yourself off, have a few good tears, maybe take a couple of days okay and then go back into the game. It, yeah. I'm sure you've experienced it. I mean, <laughs> no one doesn't. So you can't be afraid to fail either. Right. Failing is right. part of success. And if right. you're afraid to fail, you'll never succeed. Yes. And I think that that is so good. I, one of the things that you were telling me about is uh, really having that mentor. And it's, you know, even back then, having that one woman um, help you and now uh, I, I could just tell you for, personally for myself, just, you know, how, you know, gracious you've been to me and just, you know, reaching out and, and you do it for so many people, Dottie. And so it is um, really great to find that mentor, find your people, you know, that will um, help and, and then get you to the goals that you have for yourself. So, uh, you know, one of the other questions I have for you is that, you know, our audience is. Um, at Woman Up, you know, we're made up of brokers, our agents, brokers, and folks who are thinking about going out on their own, thinking about, you know, applying. And, and what, so often we have women that hold themselves back or they think they're not ready when they really are. And, you know, and we hold ourselves back so often, uh, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, and whereas I think as opposed to men who, you know, take that leap of faith when they're not quite wet, ready. So what would you recommend to our audience, uh, Dottie, to women? What should we be doing a little bit differently to help us take that leap of faith that you just described um, in whatever it is your big dreams are, whether it be uh, owning your own company, starting your own company, uh, you know, taking that leap of faith? Well, I think first of all, if I may say this, I think sometimes opportunity comes and people don't even see it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I wasn't planning to own a company. I mean, it wasn't that I said, oh gee, I'm gonna go into real estate and then buy a big company. It wasn't something that I thought about doing. Um, an opportunity happened. There was a company for sale, okay? So uh, number one, I would say to you that in the companies you work in and in, in your life, I see many opportunities that a lot of people just don't see. So always look for opportunities. And if you see something, and, and if you're not passionate about it, if you, I, I, I don't think, if you don't love what it is you're trying to do, then I don't think you'll ever be great. So I think you have to be passionate. And if you really believe in something and you think that you really can do it, people will always spend money. Money is, believe it or not, there's a lot of money. It's hard to find the talent. Yeah. So if you believe in yourself and you're willing to go out there and with a voice and you have to be convicted and you have to, you have, it's gotta come from your gut because you've gotta convince somebody to lend you money or to help you with this opportunity, you've got to, and they have to, they have to feel it from their, from your God. So you have to believe in it mm -hmm. and you have to believe in no matter what happens, I'm going to do this. And of course I'm going to have my setbacks. And if you go at things with a passion, you might fall a few times. Maybe a lot of people will say, no, no, no. I got a million no's. 
Yes. Okay. They laughed in my face, actually. And at 26, when I said, oh, I'm buying a company, they go, yeah, sure, Daddy, you're buying a company. <laughs> okay. So, but if you really, really want something, go for it. And, and, but you have to really believe it yourself. And a lot of times I find, especially with women, sometimes we don't have the best support systems. So here's my advice. First of all, stay away from anybody who's negative. Anybody that tells you you can't, don't. And a lot of times it's not that they're being mean or they don't like you. They're just afraid and they, they don't want you to fail and they're afraid you're going to fail. So anybody that was negative, I really didn't hang around with. I just stayed away from negativity. Um, you want to be around people who believe in you, who are positive. And if you don't have role models or mentors or there's no one in your family that's I would find one and you'd be surprised. Um, there's a lot of women and there's a lot of men that really, really will give a lot if you ask. Yes. Um, and so I think it's also good to have a mentor, someone you can bounce things around. Yes. I, and I think that, you know, as agents and brokers, I mean, we get people see like the top agents we are the most rejected people oh. <laughs> and in order to get to that level. We are the most rejected people. And, you know, we hear, we go on to these conferences and we see the stage, you know, filled with success stories. What they don't see, and you're absolutely right, is all those law, you know, all those no's along the way. Um, and, and, and just be, it's about how you get up and dust yourself off. And, you know, really, you know, go, go get back into the game. And well, think about it. You just said it. Top producers right. have more no's than people that, like, if you only go on two listings a month, the most <laughs> you can get are two no's. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go on 25 or 30 listings a month or 20, you're going to yeah. get more no's. And then okay? you have, right. So, right. You, so we you are, we have to, we have to, we're in a business and, and, and anyone that I've met, Okay, any women and even men that I've met that have been successful, they got millions of no's before they got a yes. So you have to be committed and you've got to feel it in your gut and decide that you're going to do this. Yeah. Um, and then network a lot and get out. Don't be in the same circles always of the same people that are never new. Yeah. Go to different things. Meet different people. Write a little, like you, you might have someone you admire in the real estate business in another state. Write to them and say, you know, I followed your career and I, I think you're, you know, you're really great. I was wondering, I mean, people, I have people that write to me from other countries that I'm, and I write back to them because I've had mentors and, 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 and people, I think there's a lot more people that will do it. I think you have to ask. Yes. Well, this brings me to my next question. You bought Douglas Elliman during 9-11, during a, a disaster and our country was in crisis. And here we are again today, 2020, November 2020, and our country is again in a national crisis with the pandemic happening. Uh, so Dottie, you negotiated probably one of the, you know, the biggest deal, which is your purchase of Douglas Elliman and that, you know, right there, what advice can you give the folks that are listening, the brokers and agents that are listening to us now on what you do when you're negotiating during a trying time like COVID? Like what advice would you give us during this pandemic? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I use numbers. But if you just take simple numbers now and Lawrence Young from the NAR publishes them, you can get them from your board. First of all, you can just have that at this moment in time, of course, nationally, okay, the sales are up. I mean, even in New York, we've done more sales. They might be less priced than we did last year. So sales are up. And I think that this, this is not a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a health crisis. Um, do I think there'll be financial casualties from it? Yes, but we're not, you know, um, I actually, I, I, I don't, I actually think that the COVID 
made us all get stuck in our houses. And some of us feel, oh, wow, this is too small. I have to have more room. Other, other people feel, I don't want to be near a city. Other people say, well, you know what? This house is important to me. I think that second homes are going to be a huge trend because I think a lot of people now will fly a little bit less. Um, I don't think this is hurting the housing business, but I will tell you, you really need to have your customers have their credit. Banks are going to be tough because you might have a job today, but I, I think they expect a second wave maybe of unemployment. So the banks are going to be tough. So what you want to make sure is that your client is pre-checked and qualified. And also, I just tell them, now is the time to buy. You can get great prices now, depending on where you're buying, if you can hold it. Um, and I don't have to make up numbers because nationally the numbers are really strong for real estate. And I think people spend so much time in their houses, it became important to them. And I think they're going to be traveling closer to home. Right. I think that the days of going to the, I'm a baby boomer. So we went to the office every single day. Um, that trend was changing before the pandemic, but the pandemic expedited it. I don't think it's ever going to go back to that. I think it'll be a combination. So if people, if people can work part of their time from their home, then they would like maybe nice space or they can maybe live further from the city. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of movement, but I still think that the people that, if you look at our whole industry, there's a small percentage that really make money. Okay. And it's not because you can't, because I think we're really lucky to be in a business like where we meet interesting people. It's never the same. It's frustrating and you have to have, you know, you got to be a little brave because you don't have a steady salary. But I really believe those who are good will do well. And my advice to you, if you're going to stay in this business, and I knew I wanted to be in real estate, I did not necessarily know if I wanted to be a salesperson my whole life. I actually thought I didn't. <laughs> um, but I went to every course I read. I went to courses. If you, This profession, there's a lot of people. But if I had to say to any of you, Gee, God, tell me how many good people that you know that you really think are good. You're probably not going to give me a big number. <laughs> right. <laughs> so to me, I thought about it because I was Series 7. I was going to be a stockbroker. But in my thinking at 24, 25, I said, well, those stockbrokers are so much smarter. I went to this real estate company. Half of them didn't make any money. It's probably a lot easier to get ahead. That's so true. <laughs> so I really think that, you know, and a lot of people don't really do it full time. They kind of play around with it. I think it's a profession. Learn as much as you can. Right. Go to as many courses as you can go to. Meet as many people. And don't always stay in California. When right. you, like, like I used to go and do meetings for the, the Prudential and the Merrill in California all the time. And they would come to New York. They used to like to come in the winter when it was snowing because they didn't have snow there. But I met so many people from other places and that's how opportunities create. And, and now with real estate, it's kind of global. Right. Like, I mean, I'm not going to try to sell you a property in California, but you, but the, people will travel. You, you can, you know how much money you can make just from referring business that a yes. lot of times we don't do. Yes, yes. And, and that is so key. I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, and I would recommend to the folks that are listening, like if you're part of a company and so often we get stuck into going to the same conferences of our respective companies or our respective boards. And I will say that a lot of the stuff that I've done has been going out and broadening that base. I mean, I started off at KW, but then, you know, a lot of, um, and I made a decision. I wanted to go into real estate tech. I didn't know a whole lot of people in real estate tech. I had to, you know, spend 
thousands and thousands of dollars going to conferences where I didn't know that many people. And eventually you started to know. Um, and so it is really spreading out your wings and uh, really making those inroads and those relationships that will, you know, really help you get to that next place. And, you know, our, our industry, Dottie, has, you know, really come so far, um, especially with women and, you know, with Susan Yaconi, who is now the CEO of uh, Realogy Franchise. That was just announced last week. And I congratulate her. Yes, yes. And I really would love to know from you, you know, how, how far you think the industry have come and what do you think still needs to happen for us at, you know, and woman up and our, you know, our folks at woman up to really help, you know, uh, to really pursue our goal. Of- yeah. I don't think it's go far enough because um, I'm not even going back because when I, when I was young, there was no women. And they might have had small companies, but there was no that I was the only woman that ran a big company. And honestly, men do think differently. So, you know, when I was trying to express myself and there's all men, sometimes women see things differently. And actually, I think that's good uh, when you have two like men, you know, when you're together to see both sides. But a lot of times the men didn't see it that way. Now I see more women, but we were talking the other day and I only could think of the three or four people that I, yes. I mean, like there's Sherry yes. that does better homes and now there's a new CEO of Reology, but I don't know that many women. And I do think, look, I like men. So, you know, and I'm not somebody that's going to say, gee, my God, I went to Studio 54 and a guy like uh, touched my leg, so I'm freaked out my whole life. However... Mm-hmm. I think that in many ways, the awareness and younger men are not the same. I think that they're more evolved. I think that they, I think that our parents, a lot of the mothers didn't work. Um, So I think it was a very different time. Men were different. You know, they were at the golf club, they ruled. So I think the younger men are different. I think they think differently. I think there's been a lot of awareness about women and again, I'm not somebody who thinks you should get hired just because you're a woman. Right. I think you have to be as good as the man, okay, if not better. But I do think companies are going to start to make an effort, okay, to hire more women and minorities and different. But you have to get out. Like, you have to go to different things. Like, you have to go to the NAR. I mean, you'll meet. And, you know, when I used to go to things, even when I went to the city, I didn't know anybody. And I remember like looking like everybody was in clicks talking and I, I uh, saw this woman standing alone. So I didn't want to look like an idiot that I didn't know anybody I'm just standing. So I went over to say something because she spoke another language and I didn't know what she was saying, but I pretended just to look like I was talking to someone. <laughs> okay. but, I, but, but you will find that that's how you grow and you did the same thing. Like, and that's an investment in yourself because a lot of people say, well, why should I? Why should I spend the money? Um, It's about meeting people. And and you know what? When I worked for Merrill, I had a mentor who said to me, I said, well, he said, you earn what you think. Mm -hmm. So if you think like a hundred thousand person, dollar person, then that's what you're going to earn. If you think like a $200,000 person, that's what you're going to earn. So you want to be around people that don't always think like you, um, that think differently, that have different views, okay? And that you make new connections. You know, it's like when you go to that local thing and all your friends, you all sit together, the same people that always sit together. You should try to mix it up. And I, you are for a lot of different things. You know, and I think being part of this group is just tremendous. Uh, and that's why, and I, I don't practice what I tell, why do you think I'm here? And why do you think I offer to be in California? I live in New York, but I do believe, and I really do believe that. And I was in California. I had a mentor that had maybe 160 offices in California. His name was Stephen Gaines. And I think he was with Merrill and then Prudential. And I was my, his New York friend. And God, we used to talk to each other and he would give me a lot of tips. And so some of the guys would call me and say, oh, Donnie, we have this new technology. And I didn't even have the money then. 
but I would fly and they would show it to me. You'd be surprised yeah. and make them know who you are. There's yeah. a million agents in this world. Okay. Yeah. Make people know who you are. Make them remember you. Absolutely. Yes. And then I, follow I, up. So like if you go to something and you meet someone and you give them a business card and you know, okay, how many business cards do we all have? If we even have them. <laughs> but then like write a little thank you or a little note saying, you know, it was great meeting you. Um, and I hope we'll run into each other again at some function. And then take a list. This is what I do. I take a list of all the people I don't know well, but I ran into them once or twice. And on the holidays, like on Thanksgiving, um, you know, on spring, I'll just say happy spring. Or just to keep your name in front of them. Earn what I, I could. I love that saying, earn, you're going to earn what you think. Um, I haven't heard that before. So that is amazing because I think I'm going to really take that in. And even, you know, in real estate tech, one of the things that, I mean, real estate is bad, but in the tech world, I can imagine tables, which is why, you know, I went into it because so often we would go, you know, as agents, we consume so much technology and so many companies are making so much money off of, you know, our uh, usership. And so often the stuff that's being built that does not have even a broker at the table, let alone a woman. And so to really change that, I mean, that really spoke to me, Dottie, to really change uh, what that table looks like. I see some folks in the chat here that's talking about getting your seat at the table, changing what that table looks like, and, you know, um, really asking for it. And if there's anything that I'm really getting out of this conversation or with you, Dottie, is not to be afraid, uh, get it, not to be afraid, um, ask for it, and, you know, and really you're gonna earn what you think and and you need to, you know, take that mindset and bring it up a notch because we really are worth so much more than what a lot of us think. So what can, for those of us who wanna get into that mindset and get, gain that confidence, I think um, that was uh, really great. So Deborah is uh, gonna be joining us right now because. This conversation, I can't believe it's all. It's all I know it goes by so quickly, doesn't I know. it? <laughs> well, I do have a, a few questions that I would love to ask the, the both of you um, specifically. So Nada asked right towards the beginning, uh, a question that I, I would love for you to answer for us, Dottie. And that is, what would you do today if you knew that you couldn't fail? If I knew that I couldn't fail, no failure. Failure would not come come in your path. Well, I'm I, I'm on it already. I'm like looking past the pandemic, and because at some point it has to end, and I'm like, okay, so what's what's the world going to be like? What changes are going to happen? What trends in real estate are here to stay? How are things going to transform? Um, and um, I do think that real estate is even going to be stronger after the pandemic. I think second homes, and this is my opinion, I think second homes are going to be bigger than ever because I think people will, I think it's going to take a while for people to feel as safe traveling. And I think people got a taste of, you know, leaving big cities just to escape the virus and renting something. And then they got used to it. Um, so I, and I think that um, real, I think that real estate, I was blessed, but I think that you have to be one of the very best. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and you have to be out there. I would do some, I would, I would, I would probably do some community Zoom meetings, keep them posted with what's going on, what things, what things are in their area. Um, but I don't see this pandemic. I, I, I worry about the credit part of it. Yeah. I don't see it stopping the real estate industry. Um, I think if anything, people will want more space or maybe different space. Now you're in California, so you have outdoor space. Obviously in New York, <laughs> there are 37,000 listings on the market. Okay. And <laughs> what I tell people is, because I have a radio show, I tell people, well, now really, Everyone buys when everything is great. 
But truthfully, if you want to get a great deal, you should buy when it's not. Right. I said, not that you should buy in New York if you don't want to live there. But what it's doing now, it's giving an opportunity to young people who really couldn't afford New York City. And the prices are really down in New York. So, and we see a lot of foreign buyers coming in buying these big buildings that let's say went for 40, 60, 80 million and are half the price. And those are people that have money, they can hold it. Yeah. And, um, but real estate, I, I think we're blessed. There's no one that doesn't want to hear about real estate. Yeah. You know? So whether you do a blog, whether you do social media, whether you do some in-person or, or Zoom meetings, inviting people. I, I don't know of too many people that don't really want to know about it. And I don't think it's going away. Right, um, right. So do you, say, do you think that you'll stay in the real estate space and, until the end? Or do you have like a passion project or something that's kind of well, what I'm really, at you? Yes, I really want to do what I'm doing right now. I really, I mean, I love real estate. I'll always... It'll be always part of me and everyone will always know me, but I would love to be able to, to help and, 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 and mentor um, people going into thinking of going into their, into business or thinking of opportunities, uh, how you raise money, whether you should do it or not, because it's not for everyone. Um, I really, I know this is going to sound Pollyanna, uh, but I really, really get pleasure out of that. And at the end of the day, I feel very lucky that I had, I mean, I did have some people I didn't like along the way, but I had a lot of great mentors. <laughs> and I think that's what it's all about. And as far as women, when my daughter came home and said to me, mom, women don't help each other. I said, BS. That's right. I said, you know, and so what I would propose we all do like is what I tell people when somebody says, oh, Dottie, how can I pay you back for that favor? I tell them the way to pay me back is you do it for somebody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's how it goes around. And I think this organization is great. And I think going to things and learning, opening up your mind, because truthfully, I think I could, if I had to say it all, you earn what you think. Yeah. Well, and something that you said that's that's really important to us around here, Dottie, is is crushing that myth that women don't support one another. I really think okay. that's a misogynistic, patriarchy pushed message that tries to keep us separate because when we do come together, we roar. We roar mightily together. We we are we truly have DNA to circle around one another and, and help. And so I love hearing that from you. I love that you are passionate about mentoring. Um, I would definitely love to get you plugged into the woman up mentorship program and, uh, you know, get your, your wisdom inside there. For those of you who haven't found a mentor yet, that's a great place to start. I did drop a link in the chat earlier. We have so many amazing women who are in there ready to mentor on a variety of things, everything from, you know, marketing to meal planning, because we do wear so many hats on yes. how, you know, what do you need help on? We can't be everything to everyone. And so there are mentors out there who have really figured some of those things out. Um, I did really love when you also talked about um, opportunity comes and so often we miss it, Dottie. And so um, I think one of the key things that you shared in there was also, that's the first time I heard you say mentor, like have a mentor because these people, and I'm not sure the person who said to you, who whispered in your ear, well, why don't you buy it, Dottie? Yeah. Like it was we, a brand new sales agent. Right. You so we all know need, anything. Right. Well, we all need those people, right? We all need those people in our world who whisper, why not you? Yes. Why not you. Um, so let me ask you both this question because you both negotiated multi-million dollar deals over the years. Do you have a ritual, something that you do? Do you stand like Wonder Woman in the mirror? Do you have an affirmation set? Do you have something that you do before you walk into the negotiation? I'm going to tell you that when I borrowed the money the second time around to buy Douglas Elman, which was 73 million, 
I had just walked out of a hospital. Um, I was 40 years old and um, I keeled over and I had a 99% 99 three quarters percent block in my main artery. And if you know anything about lending money, nobody will ever lend somebody who has a heart condition like that. I got out of the hospital and I said to myself, if I tell them, they'll never lend me the money. So I showered, got out of the hospital and went to the negotiations. And they got pretty brutal. Like two o'clock in the morning, people were cursing and that was bad. And I wasn't going to do it, but then I just did. I, I've always been me. I've always been honest as far as like, this is me. And I've always tried to have good relationships. So I did have a good relationship with the banker and I pulled him over and I said, Andrew, and his name was Andrew Downs. I said, I wasn't gonna tell you this because I knew you wouldn't lend me the money but I just walked out of the hospital this morning. I, and I really just need us to all calm down. I said, because I can't take it anymore. And he turned white, the man turned white. And I, but you know, he did not do what everyone told. Everyone told me, don't tell him, don't tell him. But he didn't, he looked at me, they went back to negotiating and he let me the money. So you, you really can't believe what other people tell you. But I also had a relationship with him. And I don't mean physical, because I don't believe you should do that with people that you're going to borrow money from. But I, uh, I met with him many a day. I went to California where he was. I had lunch with him. I'd bring him to New York. And he believed in me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that just doesn't happen. And so... In a negotiation, I don't necessarily like, you know, I think everything's different, but I don't think you start out being a bully because I think everyone knows that the whole idea of a negotiation is that two people come out feeling like they won. Yes. Yes. Well, you, you said your intuition, right? You, you said, I, I have this feeling you didn't listen to what other people have told, had told you. I'm guessing the advisors who were telling you, don't tell them about the heart condition were men. Uh, yes, they that's were. The bull and, and so this is, this is such an excellent example, everyone, of when the, the masculine energy and the feminine energy balance themselves out in ourselves. We trust that word, that still small voice inside saying, now is the time to share that. Now is the time to put that on the table. And, and it worked, right? And it, that doesn't mean it always will, but I do love that you pushed past that, that message. And you know, said, you make nope, me now's realize the time. that. And because I've not really thought about it. So just now, and the fact is everyone told me, if you tell him, he'll never lend you the money. Yeah. And they were all men. <laughs> and <laughs> And, and, you know, I, I hadn't thought about it so right now, but, but, you know, you really make a very strong point. If your gut believes in something, if you feel it in your inner soul, um, you probably should go with what you yeah. feel. Trust right. it. And, you know, I think that we, we forget that there's divine protection in those moments. So even if you had and he didn't, maybe there would have been a reason. And that was that's part of the process. Right. A lot of our failures right. are telling us we need to go a different direction. That that no from a client was mm, that wasn't going to be the right fit, that no in the listing wasn't the right fit. And we don't always know that. But if we are, we show up as ourselves, as you're talking about, like you showed up as Dottie, not as those, you know, wearing those men's suits, right? You showed up as you and you listen to your intuition. And so this is such a, it's such an important lesson for us all to learn and to, to test, test it, go out and test it. The world will not end if you hear no. Right. And, and even if there is a no, I mean, how often has it happened to each and every single one of us oh. where, you know, we thought that this was it. And if, you know, that door closed, but it ended up because that door closed, something bigger was in store for you. And I mean, and I'll tell you, even with me, when I sold my KW franchise, you know, at the time my father was uh, dying and I was pregnant. And I just couldn't keep up. And I had a partner and it, was, it wasn't it was great. 
And, you know, we, I spent a decade at KW and I sold that franchise. And when I sold it, I thought, oh, what am I going to do next? And, um, and I didn't know. And I took a break for a year and I made a decision that I wanted to go into real estate tech. And then, you know, that just led to all this other stuff that's happened in my life. And, you know, if it, was, if it wasn't for that time, that moment in time where, you know, I made a decision and that was authentically me, which was took a year off to do nothing and be with my father his last year on this earth that, you know, look at where we are next. So, so thank yeah. you for sharing. I mean, it's so touching. And it's so good. It's well, so it is good. touching. Alex, do you have a, a negotiation ritual that you go through? Uh, well, I, okay, first and foremost is you have to be you, Dottie, hit it on the head. Um, I definitely go over prepared, you know, I feel, but then, you know, I also do, I, I don't think I have a ritual other than being over prepared um, and just knowing um, everything I could know before going into that negotiation room. Um, but so often the best deals that we've ever done have been with people we know. And so I would almost ask folks to think about it this way. You know, when you treat people right and, you know, you are always on, people are watching you, even when you think they aren't, you know, in your career. And I think that so often, you know, things that you do or how you carry yourself and how people view you. I mean, it all kind of goes into that as well. And, um, and so that's something that, you know, um, Dottie, you and I talked about as well, which is really, you know, it can be good to people. It all comes around at the end. And with negotiations, you, you obviously you should be prepared, but you really don't know the person. That, if you don't know the person, yeah. then you really don't know the personalities. So yeah. I would say if you're going into a negotiation where you don't know the personalities, you kind of have to sit back and get a feel for the personalities because yeah. based on the personality, you might negotiate differently. And That's ask so lots good. of questions, lots and lots of questions. I feel that a lot of times when we go to the negotiation table, especially when you're nervous, you tend to talk a lot, you know? And I, th and I think one of the things that I've seen is that, you know, sit back, ask a lot of questions. Of course, don't take too long because, you know, it depends on wh where you are <laughs> in the situation. But, you know, I think definitely sit back, listen, ask questions because what you're going to find as you're listening is that you're going to get to the end goal a lot faster because then you'll know. So. That's so good. Well, and, and what I'm hearing from both of you is you, you keep weaving in the red thread of relationship, right? That negotiation doesn't start at the table. Yes. That, that building the relationship is, is something that we should be starting right from the beginning, whether that is starting on social media or virtual conversations, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one when we can safely in, you know, during this time, but building the relationships with the people that you hope to do business with someday. It might not even be today. It might be a year or two or 10 from now, but building that relationship is really key. Um, so let's, let's talk about the, um, the last thing is what are you up to now? Like, what are you two doing? What are you working on that the community can support you on that the, com the community can follow you and cheer you on? Uh, Dottie, let's start with you. What are you, what are you up to? Well, I, again, this has been a tough year. I mean, obviously the pandemic, um, none of us were prepared for, and um, I think just like California, we were, I happen to be in the Hamptons now, we were locked down. I was lucky to have a house here. So I left the city in May, I mean, March, when we got closed up and we were jammed out in the burbs. Um, and, you know, it was really a different, I mean, it was different. We learned how to, put, we learned how to do Zooms and things that we became very creative. <laughs> um, I became on very many boards. And then I talked a lot with the sales agents. And one of the things that I am working with sales agents now is on, um, you know, the presentation that you do for listings. When you do it face to face, it's one way. When you have to do it on Zoom, it takes on a different, 
And I think that we should come up with some courses on how to do listing presentations on Zoom. I love it. Okay, because I think that that's a different, a different connection. Um, I'm on the board of a couple of colleges and of course Douglas Elliman, uh, you know, they're all over and I, I try to keep up. I'm, I'm really building my, I really am doing a lot with social media. Now I didn't grow up with social media, so it was a push for me. This it's not something that just came to me or that I wanted to do every day. I <laughs> forced myself yeah. and I'm not great. I'm getting better, but I have a lot of followers. I'm working on a book that hopefully um, I'll get done in probably the middle of March. Uh, I'm working on a book and I had up until the pandemic, I was speaking, I was doing a lot of speaking engagements. Uh, and I think that real estate, look, everyone likes real estate, but we're in a business yeah. and whether it's real estate or any other business, okay. Business is tough. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, you know, and, and, and I, I think that, um, that, working and working with people and helping them grow, which is what I loved about growing Douglas Elliman. I mean, I grew from 36 offices to, I don't know, we have like 150 now. So, um, wow. and I do think we're all blessed because I, again, I, there are going to be many changes that, that are lasting changes that this pandemic has expedited, yes. but it's housing is not, people have to live. So they're going to live somewhere. <laughs> so true. So, uh, so let me so, let me ask you this, Dottie, because you're you have such a, a sassy, real way of talking about so many different topics. We've seen it, experienced it today, and you you did say that you have a you have a radio show. Is that something that people can hear? Is it like an internet radio show or like no, where I have a radio show? I've been doing a radio show for twelve years. It was a fluke again. <laughs> you know, I was having, that ace. <laughs> no, but I was really, I was, you know, I'm running a big company. I had no time or even thought about radio, but I was on this. Somebody asked me to be on their show. I was on it. And then their manager uh, heard me and I, he was after me. And I said, listen, I run a big company. I don't have time for any radio show. And I, P.S. to make a long story short, I promised I would do it for three months. <laughs> and um, it's 12 years later and it's called Eye on Real Estate and I have a Facebook page called Eye on Real Estate and what it really does I'd love you guys to come out and talk about your market and your organization I'd love you to be on it um, but what it is is it's a two hour show it's Saturdays well your time would be early but because New York time is 10 to 12 and people call in and I have an attorney on and a finance person and um, myself, and we talk about real estate, which I tell everybody is everything. I mean, right. I've had hoarders on, I've had tests for hoarders. How do you know if you're a hoarder? <laughs> We've had bad neighbors. What do you, you know do with a bad hoarder. neighbor? Like the neighbor from hell, okay? And then we have, you know, developers on that are, uh, you know, investors on. And um, I make it very simple like this. And I don't try to. How can I put it? Nothing ever went to my head. I am still the same person I was when I was 25 years old. I might know more, but it didn't change who I am. And along the way, there was a lot of people that really took the time to help me. So I think I'd love to keep in touch with you, give you that information. Somebody, maybe you could come on the show um, because uh, people call up and ask questions. And I think it's a service to people. And again, that doesn't make money in the sense of making millions of dollars every day. But you see a lot of things that you do in life that don't actually make money that second make you money down the road if you really care about it. So true. It, simply filling your soul tank and, right. and bringing you joy helps you negotiate bigger deals and, and right. live a happier life. I think that's so, so beautiful. Um, how about you, Alex? What, do, what are you up to? How can we support you? I know that you've had a, a career change, a shift since you were on the stage yeah. at Woman Up. So um, how can we support you? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I, I stepped down as COO of Proppy. Uh, we, and, and right before we, I helped them disclose 
uh, a round of funding. And again, talk about relationship. It was with a Japanese VC that, um, you know, I went up and that I knew through Mavoro was uh, through my contacts at SoftBank. And then, you know, they ended up um, uh, investing in uh, Proppy. Uh, and then, and the reason yeah, why I, uh, is just recently, I am just, you know, investing in some startups right now. And we just finalized a round for one of my startups um, of seed money. And so we are going to be launching. So I'm I'm investing in startups. I'm I'm Dottie. I'm going on the other side right now, rather than being just an executive at all these companies. And actually, investing. well, I would love us all to keep in touch. <laughs> yes, we certainly will. I yeah. have collected all of the notes, all of the links. Um, I did drop a link to the uh, Eye on Real Estate, the Facebook page for you, Dottie, and the podcast because uh, I listen to it over on Apple um, on podcast side of things because then it, of course it alerts me. So I love knowing that there's a Facebook page. Um, thank you to the two of you for leading us in this amazing conversation. The chat is literally on fire with so much love for you. I'll make sure to get you the transcript, Dottie, so you can see it afterwards. You can see the love for you inside there. We are all incredibly grateful for both of you investing in us today and helping us to truly level up our negotiating skills and, and see ourselves as mighty negotiators. Uh, as we're getting ready to walk out into the world today and spread our authentic selves in the situations where we are. So thank you so much. Any last words of wisdom that you two have for the community today? I want to first of all, thank you. I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. It might be a little different, but we're alive. And, and I would ask that we all do what we say and keep in touch. And I hope that I'll be invited when I can come in person and enjoy California. You know and it. Weather and meet you guys face to face. Yes, we are going to work with Kyle to make sure that is on your, your calendar. And 100% when we are live, you will be with us. You will be on the stage and you will be sprinkling your sass over all of us. I know it. I see it. Let us claim it right now. We are going to think it, believe it, see it and feel it. <laughs> How about you, Alex? Last word? Well, I want to say happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, I actually want to thank Dottie uh, for coming on this. Uh, I know that, you know, you not only did you, you know, spend the time, but really, you know, for paving the way and continuing to do exactly what you talked about, which is mentorship and, you know, helping the rest uh, of other women be able to get to their goals. So thank you, Dottie, for joining us. Yes. Thank you. And um, to everyone who's listening, uh, yes. you know, thank you for listening to us. Happy Thanksgiving. And we are here for you. I've been a woman up wave maker and I cannot tell you how much this organization has filled my soul and helped me in so, so many times with folks that I can call and be just a sounding board in um, so many of the career uh, things I have done, but also personal. So, um, so as a result, we are here for you. Reach out to us, whether it's on Facebook. You know, I can't tell you how many people have messaged me personally for just one-on-ones, people that I've never met in my entire life. But that is what we are about. And so please yes. Absolutely. We are on all of the bat channels and we, I have, I, every time we host one of these, I get all sorts of questions about how to get connected. So we, again, we'll get everyone the replay. You were here today. You'll get the first link to the first round of replays for being here with us today. And any questions that you have for Dottie or Alex, feel free to shoot them over to us at womanup at car.org and we will get them to these amazing powerhouses. Again, um, I will reiterate what these two amazing women have said, which is happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for sharing time with us today. And we look forward to seeing you in person whenever that may be. Thank you, Deborah. Happy Bye. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Bye.